Hi hey guys, it's Presley. Uh, today we are going to do the first section of the notes on Japan. We're going to get through slide 13 in your notes. So if you look at your note packet, we'll get through number 13. So let's get started. Japan is at the top of an undersea range of mountains. Um, it's very rugged and unsuitable for agriculture, except for the coastal plains, and this is going to force very crowded living conditions along the coastal areas. Japan is an archipelago, which is a group of islands. So it's on the east, it's got the Pacific Ocean, and on the west, it's got the Sea of Japan. And between the two, it's got both the warm water currents of the Pacific and the cold water currents in the Sea of Japan. Japan is very dependent on the sea. There are four main islands, and it's roughly the size of going from Maine to Georgia along the eastern coast of the United States. Japan has some very extreme climates with the way the trade winds blow. It has all four seasons, but it's possible in the in-between times, like March, to go skiing in the north, and somebody else in the southern part of Japan, it's warm enough to sunbathe. So Japan's not all that different from Oklahoma in the sense that we experience all four seasons. Traditionally, when it comes to religion in Japan, um, the native religion of Japan is Shinto. It means way of the gods. It is going to use the form of the spirits found in natural objects. These spirits are called the kami. So when you talk about kamikaze, kami means way of or spirit of, kazi meaning wind, so the great wind. Um, so when you talk about the kamikaze, we're talking about the Japanese concept of the great wind. People would build shrines to the kami wherever they felt the kami presence. There should be a picture up of a kami shrine found in the garden. One of the Shinto myths is that the emperors of Japan, including the current one, are descendants of the sun goddess. And like most Asian myths, the story goes that the various gods were backing different people. Sun goddess is going to bet her brother, the storm god, and each god's going to support a different clan who wants to rule Japan. The sun goddess is going to win, and her grandson becomes the ruler. She gives him three treasures, a bronze mirror to symbolize truth, a sword to symbolize wisdom, and a curved jewel to symbolize kindness. It is said that he passed these symbols down through generations, and the first emperor is going to show up about 600 BC in the record. Buddhism is going to enter Japan via Korea. Um, there are going to be very diff many different sects, but the first one is going to be Pure Land. It centers around a Buddha Vista named Amida, and Amida is going to rule a paradise called Pure Land. And the idea is that by placing trust in Amida and repeating his name, followers can enter that paradise of Pure Land after their death. The type of Buddhism that's going to enter Japan is going to come from China, and it's going to be Zen Buddhism. Probably the most really recognizable to most of you because of all the politicization with the samurai. And Buddhism is going to appeal to the samurai with its focus on self-control and discipline. It's going to stress meditation and clearing the mind to achieve spiritual development. The early achievements of Japan is the tale of Genji. The tale of Genji is considered the world's first novel, the story of the romantic adventures of a prince. And it's written actually by a woman. The other, one of the other achievements of early Japan are the story scrolls. The story is told as the painting is on roll. Hula is a type of drama that is very serious and very intense. They use very colorful costumes and masks, and they chant and play music and dance to teach a lesson. They feature gods and warriors, um, bad people skits, and the evening of Noah is going to be broken up into several steps. There'll be shorter, funny skits that, between the serious acts of the play. Around the year 900, the Japanese are going to simplify the writing system they have brought over from China. They are going to create a system of kana, which are a set of syllables, and each kana is going to stand for one single syllable. Historians are going to believe the first emperor is Han around the year 600. Several clans have been competing and fighting for land and power. It is the Yamato clan that's going to be able to gain the power gradually over Japan. They start with the island of Honshu and gradually expand their territory to the most fertile portion of Japan and then set up a dynasty. They are the only dynasty of Japan. They are going to win another clan's loyalty through marriage if possible, but they are willing to use warfare if needed. They claim to be descendants, direct descendants from the sun goddess. If you look at Japan's flag, the symbol of Japan is still the symbol of the rising sun. Even the current emperor, even though he has no real power, still traces his lineage to the Yamato clan, and his one of the most influential members of the Yamato family is he takes power in 593, current era, as a regent, meaning he is ruling in his own right. He's making decisions based on somebody who's either feeble or too young, unable to rule themselves. 
His goal is to unite Japan. He's going to do this by bringing Buddhism and Confucianism to Japan. Bringing Buddhism into Japan is going to help reduce the power of the clan leaders because under the Shinto religion, the clan leaders were also the religious leaders. By separating the political and religious leaders, he is able to take away some of the power of those clan leaders. There's also the concept of unity. By having one faith, he can unite the nation. By bringing Confucianism to Japan, he's going to reinforce family concepts of social order. He's going to write Japan its first constitution. It's called the Constitution of 17 Articles, and it's based largely on Buddhist and Confucian teachings. Even after his death, reforms are going to happen. The Great Change is going to pass some laws where everyone is legally a subject of the emperor, and a lot of those lands and people that were controlled by the clans under these new laws, under this great change, are now under the control of the emperor. They're also going to call for the building of a permanent. Originally, they choose the city of Nara, and they model it after the forbidden city in China. The problem, though, is that the Buddhist monks are carrying a little too much political power. So the government is going to feel threatened by this, move the capital again to Kyoto. The monks and the monasteries are not allowed to go there. And in the 800s, the emperor's power is going to start declining. The Fujiara family is running the country and setting the emperor up as a puppet. The Fujiara family is going to marry daughters to princes and... Two clans are going to join forces together and out the Fujiwara family from power. Over the years, the power is going to shift between the two clans, and they're going to start fighting each other. Clan is going to storm the palace in Kyoto, and the two clans are also going to be fighting at sea. Minamoto Yoritomo is going to be the winner, and he's going to take the title of Shogunate. This is uh, head of the military. And a new social order is going to develop underneath the concept of the Shogunate. Japan's going to shift to a very feudalistic system where you have an emperor who's technically at the top, but he doesn't have any real power. He is a spiritual or social status, but when it comes to actual decision-making for the government, he doesn't. The real power sits within the shogun, who's the head of the military. The shogun is going to be over several, several daimyo. The daimyo, or the lords, um, are those who serve the shogun by providing warriors in the form of samurai and taxes and such. The samurai are the warrior class, and probably the one class you're most familiar with. The samurai are going to follow the code of Bushido, which means the way of the warrior. It's very similar to the medieval concept of chivalry, um, by emphasizing honor and bravery and absolute loyalty. And then, of course, you've always got the peasants and merchants and artisans at the bottom. These are going to work the land for the daimyo. They're going to be protected by the samurai from other warring groups. So life under the shogunate is very lawless and very violent. So this new social order, this feudalism, is going to develop from about mm, 1200 to the late 1800s. And we call this age the age of the samurai. And the video we're going to watch and the story we're going to read uh, about the loyal retainer take place during this time.